Hello. Uh, today's topic is uh, solemn, serious. Uh, it's called The Mark of the Beast. And this was written in the book of Revelation by the uh, Apostle John. And most Christians believe this points forward to the end times, the last days, the final events of this world, world's history before Christ comes uh, in general. And so what is the mark of the beast? Well, it helps if we know who the beast is first. Then we can understand more clearly what its mark will be, right? I'll just tell you up front. Enforced Sunday legislation on a worldwide basis with an economic boycott you can't buy or sell, and finally a death decree. But first things first. We will learn who the beast is and therefore what his mark is. Stay tuned as we learn the Bible story of what the mark of the beast is all about. Uh, let's continue. Uh, let's uh, start here. We live by the highway here, so that's a big truck that just went by. So we're going to start here in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, and we read about uh, Adam and his wife Eve, and uh, she gave birth to Cain, and then she bore another child named Abel, his younger brother, and uh, Abel took care of sheep, and Cain was a farmer. And they would offer their offerings to the Lord. And Cain brought of the fruits of the ground, you know, his, uh, whatever he uh, grew in his fields, he brought in a harvest and offered that to God as a sacrifice. But there was no sign from heaven, no sense of approval from God. But Abel brought his offerings from the sheep the way God had given instruction to his parents, Adam and Eve, and God blessed that sacrifice. God, and it was known that he was blessed by offering that. So Cain got very jealous of this. And the Lord actually condescended, so to speak, came down on his level and talked to him and said that if you will control sin, that you will rule over your younger brother and all will go well with you. But Cain was not really satisfied with that conversation with the Lord. And so he took uh, Abel out to the fields, showing him his... And then he rose up and killed his brother Abel. Very sad. The first mur hu human murder. And uh, so later the Lord comes and talks to Cain and asks, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And then God just tells him that the blood of your brother cries unto me from the ground. Sad, isn't it? And so God says, for doing this, the ground will no longer yield its produce. You're not going to get a bountiful harvest from now on because of your sin and killing your brother. And Cain says, uh, my punishment's greater than I can bear. If anybody finds me, they'll kill me. You see, by this time, Adam and Eve had many, many children. They had sons, they had daughters, and there was a population. There, was, uh, there were people at that time. He says, somebody's going to kill me, as if he's afraid of his own life. And so God, again, did something special, and he put a mark on Cain that, so that whoever saw Cain would not kill him. And you'll find this in uh, chapter 4, and uh, let's see, verse, verse 15. And the Lord said to him, Therefore whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him seven times as much, sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and got pregnant and bare Enoch, and he built a city. And so anyway, this is a different Enoch from the one that was translated and taken up to heaven. This is a different one. And so anyway, uh, Cain uh, began uh, having his descendants build cities. And uh, so anyway, that's, that's the first mention of the word mark and how somebody had been marked. And uh, so we're going to look at this a little bit more. 
in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11, you'll find the Ten Commandments here. God spoke. And uh, on the fourth commandment, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, the day of rest of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your child, your daughter, your manservant, maidservant, your cattle, the stranger that is within your house, your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And we see this recorded in Genesis chapter 2. After the six days of creation week, God rested on the seventh day and gave that example to Adam and Eve and their descendants to be Sabbath keepers to remember the Sabbath and to enjoy the benefits and blessings of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a restriction to uh, enslave and make our lives miserable. That's not the point of purpose. The Sabbath is a, is a gift from God, a blessing, to uplift and inspire, to encourage, to make our lives healthier and better off for taking that time off every week, every weekly cycle, and to honor the God of heaven. Remembering the Sabbath we remember God. We remember what Jesus did for us. Remember Jesus rested on the Sabbath. When he was crucified on, the, on preparation day on Friday and put in the tomb and rested there over Sabbath. And on the first day of the week, Sunday morning, he resurrected from the dead. And so, now why do I bring out the Sabbath at this point? Because the Sabbath shows the seal of God. Uh, it has the title, the Lord. It has the position of authority, the Creator, and the area of His jurisdiction, heaven and earth. For the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and ocean, and all that in them is. And so we have the seal of God right here in uh, the Ten Commandments. And a lot of people don't want the Ten Commandments. They don't want the Sabbath. They don't want to obey God. They just want to have this thing, well, I believe, and I don't have to do anything else. I just have this intellectual consent. I, I believe, but I don't have to do anything. <laughs> well, that's not enough. Sadly, that's just not enough. Uh, like the prophet James tells us in the New Testament, faith without works is dead by itself. And so what does that mean? It just simply means that the works that we do show the faith that we have. In other words, if we believe, we will do what God asks us and commands us and tells us to do. We will honor our Master. We will honor our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandments, John chapter 14. And so God that loves us, we love God, and God tells us to do certain things for our own benefit and welfare. And so as God's as God lovers, as Christians, we just do it. And um, so here's another verse. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign or a seal upon your hand that it may be as frontlets between your eyes. So the law of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness and pure, moral purity of God, the law is a transcript of God's character, the kind of person God is. God is not a thief. He's not a murderer. He's not a, a liar. He, he doesn't uh, take advantage of other people. God is good, and he wants us to share in his goodness, in his morality, this is what makes us compatible with God in heaven, is the fact that we're like Him. As God is, so are we in this world. We are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We reflect God's image and character. We live a godly life. And by obeying God's law, we are God's special, peculiar people. And we receive the blessings of God because of our obedience to God. And so God's words, the Word of God, the Holy Scripture, the Bible, the law, the love, the truth, the Spirit of God is to be in our hand and in our mind or in our heart and in our soul. This is the seal of God, God's mark. 
upon us. And uh, very important. Isaiah chapter 8, verse eight, uh, 16, Bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. So the testimony of God's word, Old and New Testaments, and the law, the Ten Commandments, is to uh, seal among my disciples. You remember in the Old Testament times, the law was put on tables of stone and put into the Ark of the Covenant? in the sanctuary of God's presence and how it was prophesied in the last days that God's law would be put into our mind and in our heart well that's how it works you know we want God's law in our mind and in our heart so that we obey God automatically and uh, and you know the law is fulfilled in love that's the motivation that's the inspiration that's how the law is uh, honored by God and his people is love. We love God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. We love our neighbor as ourselves, and thus we, we fulfill the law. We're, we're law abiding citizens of heaven. So, our next place is Ezekiel chapter 8. We're going to look at Ezekiel 8 and 9. And again, this is talking about a mark. Uh, placed upon God's people and uh, so it came to pass Ezekiel says that the I was in my house and the elders of Judah were before me and the hand of the Lord my God fell upon me and I beheld as the likeness of the appearance of fire from his loins and downward fire and from his loins and upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber or yellow and he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looks toward the north. And there I saw the image of jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there. And he said, Son of man, lift up your eyes. And I saw the image of jealousy. And he said, Do you see what thee do? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits, that I should go far away from my sanctuary, but turn around again and you will see greater abominations. So what's happening is here is Ezekiel the prophet is taken by the Spirit of the Lord and shown the sins, the secret sins of God's professed people, the pastors, the teachers, the religious leaders, the college professors, and showing them what they're doing behind closed doors and he brought me to the door of the court and I looked and there was a hole in the wall and he said go in and behold the wicked abominations that they're doing here and I saw all kind of creeping things abominable animals the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall and there were 70 men of the ancients of the elders of Israel and they had a censers in their hand and a thick cloud of incense going up. And he said, Son of man, the Lord is saying, Ezekiel, have you seen what the elders, the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? And they say, this is what they're saying. The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the earth. It's sad, isn't it? And he said, turn again and you will see greater abominations. And so then he then I saw women weeping and crying for Tamas, this idolatrous god of the heathen. And he said, Have you seen this, son of man? Turn again and you'll see greater abominations. He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house in the temple of the Lord. And there were 25 men. Their backs was toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. They were worshiping sun, the sun. Sunday, worshiping the sun. And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? The abominations, the violence, they put the branch to their nose. Maybe they were smoking some kind of dope. Therefore, I will deal in fury. My eye shall not spare. I will not have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear. This is very sad. They were sealing their probation with their sin. Now chapter 9. So he cried in my ears with a loud voice saying, 
cause those that have charge over the city to draw near, every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So these were leaders, these had weapons of war, and they were gathered together now. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, and they had a slaughter weapon in their, in their hands. And there was one man among them, clothed with linen, probably white linen like an angel, and had a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in, and they stood around the, the brass altar in the sanctuary. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, the angel, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, and said, Go through the midst of the city. He had an ink horn. You remember uh, ink he had a, to uh, write with? He's telling this man to go in, through the midst of the city and Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Oh, it's terrible what they're doing. Have you heard the latest report, the sins that they're doing, the corruption in the government? And, and, and so they get a, a, a mark, like a seal in their forehead, saying that these are God's people. These are the people that are against the evil abominations and the corruption in the government, the corruption that's going on in the land. These are crying to God day and night for, uh, for, for righteousness. And, uh, and to the other men, those six men, he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and strike. Let not your eye spare, neither have pity. Kill utterly old and young, maids and little children and women, but do not come near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, the elders, which were before the house. And he said, Defile the house and fill the courts with the dead. Go forth. And they went forth and started killing in the city. And it came to pass while they were killing them, and I was left that I fell upon my face. And I cried, and I said, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the rest of Israel in the pouring out of your fury upon Jerusalem? And he said, The sins of, the, of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the earth, and the Lord does not see. They, they might have had the LGBTQ movement there. It's really sad what they were doing. They, they were taking advantage of, of innocent people and it just came to a point where there was no remedy left as for me also my eye shall not spare neither will I have pity I will recompense their way upon their head I will pay them back what they deserve as they have done it will be done to them and behold the man clothed with linen which had the inkhorn by his side reported the matter saying I have done as you have commanded me so this marking this sealing of God's people had been done in, in times past. And it's going to be done again in the near future, as John uh, revealed it in the book of Revelation. Um, Ezekiel also tells us in chapter 20, verse 20, And hallow or make holy my Sabbaths, and these shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So God has given his people a special sign, a seal, a point of connection with his believers, his followers. You know, Jesus, he observed the Sabbath. Uh, his disciples observed the Sabbath. The Apostle Paul observed the Sabbath. The early church kept the Sabbath. And Jesus said that in the time of persecution, pray that you won't have to run away or flee in the winter time or on the Sabbath day. And this was long into the future. And so, how did the Sabbath get replaced? at least partially, by Sunday. How did that happen? Well, we're going to take a look at that. Uh, Ephesians, New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, uh, 13. In whom you also trusted in God, after that you... After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit's been sealing people ever since. 
And as we come to Christ, we ask forgiveness, we get forgiveness for our sins, we are accepted in Christ, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our names are written in the book of life. And it remains there as long as we're faithful to God. But if we turn away from God, if we go back into the world of sin, we lose that connection. We lose that seal. Our name will be blotted out of the book of life if we die in an unrepentant, sinful condition. And so it's very important that we make our calling and election sure that the gates of paradise will be wide open so we can enter in. Now let's go to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 13. And John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, or the devil, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So John is uh, borrowing from the visions of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And Daniel saw these beasts rise up out of the sea. Now the sea is water, ocean, representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And Daniel saw these beasts rise up one after the other. There was a lion representing Babylon. There was uh, the bear representing the, the Medes and the Persian Empire. There was the leopard representing Greece, the Grecian Empire, the Greeks. And finally, there was another strange creature that was representing Rome. And when John wrote the Revelation, Rome, the Roman Empire, was in, in existence at that time. It was Roman soldiers that crucified Jesus. Uh, Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor, when uh, Joseph and Mary went to uh, Bethlehem and, and gave birth to Jesus, Messiah. And so John is seeing a summary of Daniel's vision here. Excuse me. And this... And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and its deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So these heads are world empires. You've got uh, Egypt, Assyria, you got Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, Greece, and Rome. And then you've got Papal Rome. He had a deadly wound, then the wound was healed over time, and uh, then you've got the... Uh, the papacy again in, uh, in, a, in power. And so let's continue here. And they worshiped the dragon, or the devil, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he made war with the saints and overcame them. And power and authority was given him over all nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And let every man ha has an ear, let him hear. Uh, here is the patience and faith of the saints. So let's think, let's talk a little bit about who this beast is. I'll just tell you, this beast... Uh, was first the Roman Empire, and later it became the uh, the Roman Church, or the papacy. And they have a boast here. They're boasting who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him, because he has military power. But this boast is answered in a couple chapters later, in chapter 15, where the saints get victory. I saw a, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had gotten victory over the beast and his image, over his mark and the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you for your judgments are made manifest. So this is the answer to that boast. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Because the saints will get victory over the beast and over his mark, and they will sing songs of praise to God, and the nations will come and worship before God. So God will get the victory in the end. And uh, But that's not the end of the story. So this that's the beast power. Blasphemy. 
You know, he claims to forgive sins. He claims to be God on earth. He claims to uh, eat the very body of Christ, you know. And I could go into great detail about this. Uh, the idolatry of worshiping statues and images and, and, and so on. See, they claim the Bible, but they also claim tradition. Church tradition is above the Bible in their in their teaching. So you got the Bible and then you <coughs> excuse me. And you got tradition. And tradition is where the er is where the errors are. <coughs> My throat's a little dry. I'm not used to talking this much. Okay, so and I be ill <coughs> Another beast, another beast coming up out of the earth with two horns, two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Now this beast is the United States, representing civil and religious freedom. That's the two horns. <clears throat> but he spoke as a dragon. The end result is he will turn away from freedom. And it will start oppressing the people and forcing religion on people. We're in chapter 13, uh, verse 12. He exercises all the power of the first beast and forces the earth and the people to worship the first beast, the papacy. And he does great wonders, making fire come down from heaven. And he, deceived, he deceives those that dwell on the earth by miracles. And he should make an image to the beast. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that it would cause that those who do not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all people to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Nobody can buy or sell except those who have the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Let's talk about that. So the second beast is the United States of America, claiming to be a Christian nation. But later on, it becomes a... it, it speaks as a dragon. And so it's going to become an image to the first beast. It's going to become like the Roman church. It's going to persecute dissenters, those who don't go along with the world religion that they're pushing, the one world order, which is going to be forced Sunday observance. You cannot buy or sell unless you go along with this religious system. And its number is 666, 666. And its mark will be enforced Sunday legislation worldwide. The new, the one world religion. religion. <clears throat> so it will be a great challenge, a great test for God's people at that time to stand firm on the word of God. We must, we must obey God rather than men. When it comes right down to, when push gives, you know, uh, we just have to follow God's law above the law of humanity. That's where our loyalty is. That's when we receive the seal of God fully or the mark of the beast fully at that time. This is a future event. The mark of the beast is not now. It's a future event. It's getting closer by the day. And uh, so we just have to be ready for that time. I think after uh, I, I, I see the signs. It's getting closer. So we'll leave it at that. And in um, chapter 14 of Revelation, uh, I saw Jesus on Mount Zion, God's people, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. They have God's seal in their foreheads. And uh, they were singing a new song. And these people were God's, God's chosen people. They were redeemed from among men. They are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no lying or telling lies, for they are without fault before the throne of God. 
They are God's uh, devoted followers. And we can be among that group. If we're faithful and we take a stand on the Lord's side and we're obeying His commandments, we can be among the 144,000. We can be among God's chosen people at that time. And so then you have these three messages, three angels' messages that are proclaimed to the world to prepare the uh, uh, God's people to stand against the beast and his mark. And uh, I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to all people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the ocean, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Worship the Creator. Worship the one who made everything and rested on the seventh day. Worship him. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All nations are drinking of the teachings of Babylon and being corrupted. And so God is calling us to come out of Babylon and join those who love and obey God and worship God. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone or sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the smoke of their torment ascends or goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's talk about that for a moment. So this is the final war here on earth uh, before Christ comes, leading right up to that event between God's people, the saints, and and the false teachers, the false prophets, the the uh, the apostasy, the rebellious, uh, the wicked, the lost sinner, and uh, I see a lot in this. When Jesus and His angels come in a flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, uh, they will be cast in an everlasting fire prepared for the devil as angels. They will be destroyed. They will be uh, punished. And how this, the way I understand how this happens is when Christ comes they will see his face. King of kings, Lord of lords. He is the owner of this earth. He is the creator of this earth. And he's coming back to get his children out of it. To take us into paradise. And when these People that have the mark of the beast, when they see the face of Jesus, that innocent, loving, kind, righteous, holy face of Jesus, and they realize that they do not measure up. They are weighed in the balances of the sanctuary. They're found one thing. They're lacking. They don't have what it takes to enter into glory. They, they would not be, they're not comfortable in his kind, holy, just, and righteous presence. They, they sense and sins. they are in their sins. They're, they're living sin all the time. Lying, cheating, stealing, killing, worshiping devils and idols. They're constantly, they're just not right with God. And so the presence of Jesus and his angels is burning their consciences with a hot iron. And it's just torment. They just can't take it. And they have no rest day or night. They're suffering terribly. And so that's how they die in their sins. But God's people are taken up to meet the Lord in the air, to ever be with the Lord. We will change from this body of flesh to immortality in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. But that trumpet will sound, the seventh trumpet. And Christ is coming and he will... and then. The, the resurrection of the dead. All the righteous who are asleep in their graves will come up out of their graves and they will we'll all go up together to meet the Lord in the air. And what a glorious day that will be. And we'll be with the Lord for 1,000 years in paradise. And the people on this planet will kill each other, kill themselves. There won't be anybody left on this world. The cities will be broken down by the presence of the Lord. They'll just be, you know, they're going to be burned up in the fires. And 
the only ones on this dark, desolate planet for a thousand, year, thousand years will be the devil and his angels. To see the fruits of their labors, to see their work, everything's broke down, and there's nobody left to tempt or annoy. They suffer terribly during that time, and they deserve it. But we'll be in heaven, and then after that we'll come back to this earth. And, uh, and then the wicked who are asleep in their graves, they'll be resurrected. And Satan will deceive them one last time, Gog and Magog. And they will surround the holy city, the new Jerusalem, that had come down from God out of heaven. They will surround that city and try to overcome it. But they fail. Because Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And, uh, and that's why they are going to be in a lake of fire and brimstone. Because they're in his presence. And when you see Jesus on that throne, earth and heaven flees away and no place found for them. That means they only have one focus in their mind. It's not earth, it's not heaven, it's Jesus Christ on that throne because they are being judged for their sins. And all whose names are not found written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So all these wicked people have to die that second death, every one of them, the devil and his angels. And uh, let's see if I missed out on anything here. Let me go back and check. Uh, let's see. The coming of Christ. Okay. Yeah, so let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 19. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, Jesus Christ and his angels. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. And these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So I kind of forgot to quote that scripture, but we already talked about that. How these people will uh, face Jesus and be have that lake of fire experience and then die in their sins. And in Judgment Day, Revelation 20, when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and will go out to deceive the, deceive the nations, Gog and Magog. And so they gather around the city and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This fire is God's presence, His truth, His holiness, His righteousness, His judgment, His decision. And this fire devours them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into this lake of fire and brimstone where the beast of false prophet ended up. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now the words forever and ever do not mean without end as used in the Bible. Forever and ever, eternal, using the Bible, everlasting. These words mean for a period of time. Could be a long time or a short time. Uh, ages, um, always or continuously can be translated like that. But it doesn't really mean without end as used in the Bible. And so, and then there's the great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open. Another book is opened, which is the book of life, and the dead are judged uh, out of those things written in the books. And death and the grave were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whoever was not found written in the book was cast in the lake of fire. And, uh, and in Revelation 21, um, John continues his vision, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, The tabernacle or the temple or sanctuary of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death or sorrow or crying, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And right, for these words are true and faithful. And I'm glad John wrote those words. I'm glad we can read these words. I'm glad we can have this information. <clears throat> and then uh, later on here in uh, verse 22, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, Jesus, are the temple of it. So we are, God is the temple in the uh, New Jerusalem. And uh, the nations of those who are saved will walk in the light of it, 
the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. The gates will not be shut at all by day. There will be no night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles or works abomination or lies. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we've got chapter 22. He showed me a pure river, the water of life, from the throne of God, and the tree of life, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And they will see his face, and his name will be in their foreheads. And we will see the face of God face to face. What a, a blessing that will be. And there will be no night there, and... He said to me, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly uh, be done. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation is a special book for our time. And John wrote quite a bit about our time. Because the saints needed this confirmation and information and instruction so that we can face off with the beast in his image and get victory in Jesus name we will get victory over the beast over his image over his mark and the number of his name we will get victory because we love Jesus and we obey him and uh, so Jesus says behold I come quickly my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be Let's see if I covered it all he says he that testifies these things says surely I come quickly Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, we wonder, Jesus said he's coming quickly, but these words were penned about 2000, almost 2,000 years ago. And, But you know, we don't live that long. Even if we live 100 years, what is that compared to our immortal state where we'll never die again? So, in a sense, Jesus does come quickly, whether we live in this lifetime or whether we're actually alive when he does literally come. And he will literally come. Will you be there in that final generation? Uh, and I think it might be this generation. I really think we're that close where we have an opportunity to be alive at the coming of Christ. I think we're that close. I think we're going to have a turn of events, perhaps this next election. I think that things are being set up for the pendulum to swing from what from one political side to the other and I think the conservative right is going to get the, the powers of government perhaps and I think they're going to bring in strong religious uh, push and that's where they're going to push the mark of the beast see they're going to push uh, sun, Sunday worship on all the all the world all the nations and and they're going to set it up where we can't buy or sell unless we have the mark of the beast unless we're a part of this system that's a great test for God's people but we're going to pass the test we're going to get victory and we're going to be faithful we're going to keep praying and we're going to have a large measure of God's spirit and we're going to be blessed thank you friends God bless you in your Bible study and your walk with the Lord God's presence is healing God's presence is love get to know God get to dwell and bask in his presence on a daily basis be healed of your diseases be blessed in all that you do. Walk with the Lord, and God will bless you more and more. Thank you.